You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. The diversification is upon us. Congress sells out consumer privacy, how the law applies to Dash, Ethereum votes on the future of mining rewards, all this and more here on our 200th episode. Yay, Neo Cash. Here on March 29th. 2017. In the traditional markets, we have gold up to $1,253, silver's up to $18.20, oil's up to $49.44, the Dow is fairly steady at 20,663 points, and 30 year treasury yield has actually uh, gone down to below three at 2.984%. And in the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin up to $1,040. Ethereum rises to $52.94. Dash is down to $84.20. Zcash also down to $63.40. And Monero down to $19.80. Just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocash every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY, and more. So, uh, yes, here's our two, 200th episode, Darren. Yay! Yay. There we go. Uh-huh. It's, it, we're, we're coming up on the four-year episode, too, so, it, I mean, uh, it, I guess it's we celebrate? a horse of peace. I don't know. Let's don't celebrate. Know. Let's just celebrate the 200th, and we'll celebrate okay. again in eight more episodes. Yeah. I'm, I'm down for extra cake, even though I've only been here for, you know, like 60 of them. Or not even. How many episodes? Yeah, I wish we could share this cake know. with the listeners. Right. <laughs> There's so much cake. So much yes. cake. All right. To start out with, we have, like, pretty much our only non-crypto news story of the night. Randy, what's going on with the cable companies? Well, the U.S. government doesn't want anyone to have any privacy. Um, they're, they've basically repealed broadband privacy rules. So Congress, both the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives, have sided with the cable and telephone industry, not surprisingly. Uh, this is something that is now going to President Trump. Still sounds funny every time I hear it and say it. Um, <laughs> but uh, this will allow internet providers like Cox, Time Warner, AT&T, and Comcast to sell your search inputs, your browsing data to the highest bidders, all without your consent. So we're not talking about websites that are using cookies and stuff. This is your actual ISP, the people you pay to deliver the internet to your house. And so certainly this is going to like push mesh networks and things like that. Yeah. People, they seem to just be digging their own graves deeper and deeper for the short-term uh, returns um and so these companies time warner at&t we've reported on how crappy they are with uh consumer privacy and how they've been embroiled in all kinds of scandals before selling user data to law enforcement officials for money um the, the uh, electronic frontier Fund- foundation um the link of course is on neocashradio.com they've written about uh several of the just the intrusive ways that isps have already tried to start to hijack your searches and how uh, just a few years ago, they were d- using these things called super cookies that would just track everything you were doing. I mean, like everything, even if you mistyped something or if you like put a bid on an auction, like everything was being tracked. And there, even after you cleared your history, they had these, like they, they started calling them zombie cookies. So uh, this kind, these are the kinds of companies that are going to uh, now, that are now going to be able to sell all of your private data to the highest bidder. So there was one uh, critic of the repeal um, there were more than that, but this one critic of the repeal told Reuters that many of the major Silicon Valley companies that uh, usually stand up for privacy rights shied away from this fight because uh, they profit greatly from getting consumer data. So, wow, that's why we haven't heard too much about it. Well, it's you know it, there was sort of after the election there was this post truth thing that they were pushing out there uh, because you know all the lying and whatnot from everyone involved pretty much. I mean, I you don't have to pick a side. Everyone was lying, but. I think really what this is, is this is the post-privacy era, right? This is where it's been revealed that the technology exists to pretty much hack everything you have. And all of your all of your movements is pretty much sold that can be sold outside of the ISP. And now this is finally the ISP. So there, there really isn't any privacy left at this point. I you mean, know, certainly not online. And it's encroaching into more and more uh, areas of, of life. That's right. Well, and the EFF is also calling this sort of another sort of privacy tax where people are forced to pay to use like a VPN service or something to to cloud, um, to mask a little bit where their where their uh, data is getting to and things like that. So, But it, it does add cost. Well, moving on to other news stories because we have so much to get to today. Uh, Ethereum is is always it's exciting to see what Ethereum comes out with because they're not afraid to try new things and they're not afraid to radically alter 
the way you think about blockchain. So they're they're going to fork. They're going to plan on, or there's there's a vote actually out there that's going to happen, and it's, and it's going to lead to a hard fork if if a vote goes a certain way. Now let me explain. Ethereum has always had a plan to move from proof of work consensus method to a proof of stake method. Built in the protocol is something called a difficulty bomb that is meant to ratchet up the difficulty of finding the right solution and creating the new block. The time frame surrounding this rise in difficulty is being called the Ice Age. While proof-of-stake plans are still in the works, S holders are being asked how the dev team ought to handle the changing landscape. The Ethereum Improvement Proposal 186 details what options are and why the need for, to change the protocol. S holders can vote for a variation of the EIP-186 solution by sending a 0S transaction to the voting address of their choice. Options include a no vote, which will see no changes, and four yes votes. Currently, uh, the miner's reward is five Ether. So uh, a yes vote will delay the Ice Age and reduce the, the mining reward. The amount of Ether held at the address you vote from will be added to the weight of the vote you cast at the time of counting. The vote being held on uh, Carbon Vote, that's the same platform they use the DAO uh, token, uh, the DAO vote when the uh, the hard fork happened for that. To refund the uh, the, the funds? Yes, to, okay. yeah, to change the, uh, the hard fork, the code to, to fix the DAO, uh, the DAO. And uh, the current leader as of this recording is the yes vote with the highest mining reward or the, the lowest amount of reduction. So... Uh, each of the yes votes has a, a, re- a reduction in mining reward. So as it stands now, it's five. And the first, the, the highest yes vote has between four and three, and then between two and three, and then between uh, one and two, and then zero and one. So um, currently that is by far in the lead. And, and I don't know exactly when they're going to tally the votes. Okay. So the votes can change. In fact, you can change your vote. So it's basically whatever address you have you've sent your coins, uh, your zero transaction from. You can send another one, and it'll just take your old vote away and replace it with your new vote. Hmm. Got it. And if at the last minute you decide oh, I don't want to give it any weight, you can move all your coins out of that address when it's counted, and it will receive zero weight. So okay. there's a bunch of options mm-hmm. for how to handle this. But really, I think um, what's interesting about this is that some of the discussions around why this is changing and why it has to change. Is, d- is due to reducing the dispersal or the amount of ether created over time, the inflation of the coin, and the uh, to make the protocol more attractive to investors and people wanting to to see more value in the coin to help the the, the price rise basically huh. by reducing the the like our current inflation is of Ethereum is at five right. per block, so this would this would with a yes vote instantly reduce that inflation and then it would what it would do also is is during the ice age it would reduce from so whatever the the peak amount is in that yes vote to the low amount so it would over time uh travel from in the, as this example from 4 ether down to 3 ether hmm. over so the course of time in theory it could again be put to a vote later to change it again be either up or down depending it's con- community controlled inflation in a way well it is but i think what this does is it sets it on an automatic path to continue to deflate like this or to continue to reduce inflation over time because it's basically pushing the ice age back but it's also adding the ice age in Hmm. so it's getting the ice age to do what it wants which is reduce the amount of ether produced over time per time and it's it's also giving them more time to set up this proof of stake algorithm Hmm. so so it's it, it's exciting and it's like look at this is bold moves by a platform that is now has the second highest market cap coin cap of any coin. Yeah, that's in history. Yeah, that's and they're not afraid to vote and change and hard fork whatever needs to be hard forked because I think obviously their mentality is we need to produce something that works and we're not there yeah, yet. I, I I I think it's great to produce something that works and I I don't don't see an inherent flaw with this. Um, proposal, perhaps if the reward was too small, that might be a problem. But uh, uh, I can see kind of a problem down the road if they actually always go with with what the vote's for. Sure. I mean, just because people vote for it doesn't mean it's a good thing or doesn't even mean it's possible. No, I, so. I, I definitely see what you're saying and how this could be yeah. sort of uh, leading to some bad results. But so I, Yeah, there was, a, I, there was a quote I saw on one of the, I think a Reddit thread today, something like, uh, don't confuse... Uh, calm waters for good sailors and that just 
it, I think it was in one of the Bitcoin threads or something, but it, yeah, I, 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 it was just something that struck me just now when we were talking about this, but I also wanted to talk about coin caps. Ethereum does not have a cap. Is that correct? To the number of like coins that will be They're created. Correct. correct okay. Yeah. yeah. So whereas like Bitcoin has 21 million. That's it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As far as market cap. I right. Mean, so the amount of value. It, I mean, especially this week, I mean, Ethereum is up over $50 now. Right. And, and it, you know, it's sort of, it's one of those things where when, when before the DAO happened, like Ethereum was up at $21 ish and, and heading towards this mark that it's at now. And that that sort of uh, event has really, I think, given pause to developers, and so that they're they're actually spending more time to roll out better products, which I think will lead to a better finished product for everyone. If if in fact that's what's happening, so mm-hmm. they sort of it was going so fast, and the, and the speed was just incredible. Yeah, and it needed to hit a speed bump, I think, just to keep everything under control. Mm-hmm. But uh, we I'm got, sure it was a humbling experience. Oh, sure, but so. Uh, more, more to talk about. And another, another coin that's, that's just jumping out of the water right now, Dash. Yep. Yeah. So Dash just published, uh, some legal research that was funded. Uh, so Dash is a little different in that they have a community development fund built into the block reward. So there's a 10% of the block reward goes towards this, uh, fund that can allow for, uh, future, future development, marketing, things like that, whatever any, masternodes any vote for. Any project that people propose and the masternodes vote for. Yeah, so last September, one of the things they did vote to fund was some uh, preliminary legal research on several of the topics uh, that were important, that they got a lot of questions about relating to mostly U.S. law, tax law. And uh, so they just released uh, this legal research that's just the legal opinion of two different law firms. Um, it's not something they're saying that someone should necessarily rely on as as legal advice or as, as law. It's an interpretation of law uh, by these law firms, and certainly uh, we're not reporting anything as legal opinion here. Uh, but anyway, they talk a little bit about uh, capital gains tax liability and how it's their belief that uh, this, that Dash pay, dash investments, um, if someone's making an investment and they make some money or if they're using a masternode and they get uh, payouts for mining or something like that, um, that, that this could be treated as capital gains, but that it should be treated, that the IRS would consider it um, income for the year, but it would be subject to capital gains. Um, they also talk about the legality of private transactions and coin mixing. Uh, I guess they get a lot of questions saying, does that sort of raise suspicion or uh, imply that something illegal is happening? And if you're running a Dash master node and say something illegal is purchased with Dash and your master node relays the transaction, uh, are you uh, somehow uh, are, are you somehow aiding like and abetting? A, uh, yeah, a part of that. Thing. Yeah, so there's the, the legal opinion here is that no, uh, the criminal liability would be unlikely for master node operators. Um, and they also talk about how private send transactions are often used for what they call legitimate purposes and are required to achieve personal or commercial privacy for sensitive transactions and that the use of private send transactions is not inherently suspicious. And um, I, I really liked reading this quote from Dash founder and lead developer Evan Duffield on Reddit. Uh, he said, quote, I think it should be stated unambiguously. The purpose of the Dash mixing and privacy implementation is for improved fungibility, which is the unique characteristic of Dash acting as a cash medium. Um, so just the ability for right. coins to be used just like cash. There's no transaction history per coin to say like, oh, this was used for an illegal... Sure. You can reuse it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, back to the quote, the world economy, excluding the black markets is 77 to $125 trillion. We want a piece of that. I don't think we're worried about the transactions going through the mixing service because we're aligning ourselves as a medium for standard use, not illegal activities. We want mass adoption. It's good for everyone involved and governments don't mind new innovative technologies that expand the economy and reduce costs to do business. It's a win-win end quote. Uh, And just to wrap this up quickly, there was another law group that was also approached by Dash, and they gave legal opinions surrounding uh, compliance requirements for running a commercial exchange from Dash to fiat currency. So if you wanted to uh, run a Dash vending machine or a kiosk or a Dash ATM or something like that, um, there's some legal uh, opinion that was posted by this other law group that can give some kind of regulatory uh, guidance. And so, again, that was funded by the Dash DAO, so by masternodes voting in support. for something like this, it's pretty neat that that's built into the system. So yeah, I mean, and that's that's definitely one of the things about Dash that I always try to point to as one of the value propositions. 
You know, it's it's unique for for this currency, right? Yeah, and in, in a previous post on the forums, actually, someone had noted. Um, by funding this expense once through the network, individual masternode owners can avoid replicating this cost on an individual basis and benefit from the legal opinions. So instead of uh, you know, 4,000 4, people going out and doing this on their own and paying 4,000 different people to give them 4,000 different opinions, hey, here's a starting one to, to go off of. So it's, yeah, it's yeah, neat. I, I think it's going to be a, an ongoing thing as governments learn more about what it, the blockchain is and, and as people... And as the blockchain evolves, so it's going to continue to change. But uh, moving on, uh, more Ethereum news here. Never use passwords again with Ethereum and MetaMask. Yes, yeah, so uh, Ethereum has uh, private keys and public keys. Just, That's right. Just like all the others. And uh, this is something I've thought that should be happened for a while. I'm, I'm not necessarily through Ethereum, but just through some type of software. I mean, isn't that what a blockchain is good at, is, is, is identifying you are the owner of this whatever it is? Yeah, it's, it's, they're good at that, but uh, a PGP key can do that, and there's uh, other ways to do that. Sure. Um, but uh, so anyway, so um, but what Ethereum is, is doing is they're uh, allowing you to basically sign into a website without entering a password. And uh, this is really interesting to me because I, I don't really like the uh, the biometric uh, logins and all that. That's a uh, it's a little creepy to me. Uh, but but there is the the ability to uh, just sign something with your private key, and uh, boom, you're in. And it's actually more secure than a password. Yeah, you're not transmitting uh, your password across any mm -hmm. lines this way, unencrypted or encrypted, and you're your password isn't being stored on a central data server. This is something that can be verified yeah. just like I, probably similar to the, yeah, you so can probably start. I'm surprised I haven't seen like keep keys and the ledgers and Trezor, the hardware wallets allow you to have a PGP key loaded on them yet so that you can sign things without ever revealing your key. Right. Just using that as, as the hardware to sign it. Yeah. I mean, this is something that should have been a long time coming. Uh, the the you know, having it implemented through Ethereum. I mean, of course, you've got that whole blockchain that comes along with it. But it's kind of like if you're already using Ethereum, then uh, then you've got that there. You've already got that functionality. Sure. And MetaMask has just made that, so you don't need to program so, it. So MetaMask is just a it's a browser plugin. Yeah. It's okay. A, so something pops up, and basically you would. It'd be like signing a zero F transaction, showing that you're the owner of this account. And Actually, you're not even signing a transaction. Okay. You're signing a message. So it's using JSON web tokens. Now, this isn't a new thing. JSON right, web tokens sure. have yeah. been used before. And what it, that's basically what it does is it gives you a, a time-limited access to this the API of this website based on the token and the agreement. You yeah, know, and, and I, then, I send you gobbledygook. You sign it. Send it back. You've exactly. Proven, you've proven who you are. Yeah, there's no transaction that actually happens. Okay. You're simply signing a message with your key. Usually, I, usually it's just a big number. It's it's. I say gobbledygook, but it's just you sign something that has enough randomness in it that uh, you haven't signed it before, and and just send that back, and and uh, that's a very secure uh, signing in method. Cool. So yeah, it's a Chrome uh, plugin, and we'll have links on our website where you can find out. It was developed by uh, Consensus, and uh, down in down in uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, cool, New York. So um, down, yeah, down. I say down. Well, we're 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 in New Hampshire. It's so it's a little chilly here today. Yeah, it is a little. Oh, I'd like it. It's fine. <laughs> All right, there. All right. So next up, well, we've got a big story of, of well, a, a big company and a big place, Alibaba. Yeah, and the link to this, of course, is going to be up on the website. I think it's a really interesting article uh, to go through all the way. I'm going to sum it up as much as I can. Um, Alibaba, a couple years ago had a record-setting IPO, $25 billion in the United States, and they have been a uh, billion with a B. Uh, they've been buying up companies since, including a big $793 million stake in uh, the U.S. augmented reality company Magic Leap and a $1.25 billion stake in, Chinese, in a Chinese food delivery startup. Um, I had no idea they have a huge like payments and finance arm called Ant Financial. It's like a $60 billion um, payments industry. At banking and things like that, mobile banking. Um, they just a few months ago they put in a bid for eight hundred and eighty million dollars to buy MoneyGram, so something like Western Union that does a lot of cross country remittance payments. Um, they it's subject to regulatory approval. It might clear the second half of this year is what's projected, um, but it's anticipated that they're going to get the get the approval they need to buy MoneyGram. So that'll be uh, a, a huge asset. Yeah, I mean they, this is get. a really huge company that actually was. 
uh, it's from the outside the United States. Yeah. So when it's IPO in happened in the United States, it's already a massive company abroad. Mm-hmm. And then the IPO is, you know, massive. So all of a sudden they're just you know, accelerated in growth. Yeah, they've been buying e-commerce companies in the, in India and the Philippines. Uh, so back to Ant Financial, they have a mobile payments app called Alipay, and it has over 450 million users right now. And uh, they're looking to use blockchain technology to help scale to 2 billion users within 10 years. Um, the article goes on to really point out um, how they're trying to build sort of a new Silk Road to get Chinese goods into every corner of the globe. It's a program called One Belt, One Road, and uh, Xi Pinjing has been trying to, yeah, make a wa- modern web of land and sea routes to get stuff like all Chinese over the place. Goods yeah, so everywhere. Uh, they started an Asian infrastructure bank in 2015, and uh, they're planning land routes through Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, Eastern Europe. Um, they're just investing heavily in these foreign infrastructure projects. And all the while, Alibaba is building all these logistics centers and distribution hubs along sort of along the way. And so we are seeing this construction of, of a sort of a new Silk Road, but also on the digital side, um, they're, they're using blockchain already. Just a few months ago, they started using something called the law chain, which sounds terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so there's all this kind of cool that? news. No, I have So it's basically a repository of uh, legal yep. documents and municipal documents and, and bills and things like that. And and contracts and things like that. It's the the goal, uh, the, the the you know the selling point of it. It was meant to be uh, to aid the court system in processing because then you would have a central repository to draw from rather than all of these different uh, paper and municipalities and you have to travel and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, well, but they're moving. also looking to back up email. Oh yeah. Oh, and on that's on the law chain. So oh, yes. you're talking about large scale digital evidence, uh, you know, like emails. All of your email that they can prove on a blockchain yes, were yours that you were sent, and like these are totally available for inspection at any time. Uh, well, um, for China, it, they have that national archive where they they track everything you do. It's yeah, part mm-hmm. of the national record. Well, one of the mm-hmm. cooler things, in my opinion, that they uh, are looking at they t- they teamed up with Price Waterhouse Coopers recently to sort of build a pilot blockchain platform to help prevent counterfeit food products from getting to consumers. So it's proving provenance. Uh, sort of tracking the flow of foods from producer to consumer. They're calling it the food trust framework, and uh, they're they're launching it as a ta- as like a beta test in Australia. And uh, I guess counterfeit food is a is a big problem where they're saying uh, something's olive oil, but they're using much cheaper wow. uh, like safflower oil or vegetable oil. But uh, even things like high end cheese or high end wine, there there's been all kinds of cases of counterfeit wines being produced with fake labels put on them to look like they're antique bottles, but they're not. And so this kind of stuff can actually blockchain technology can be huge for proving provenance and proof of origin and just tracking things along a supply chain to show that nothing was altered. Yeah, totally. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Uh, So news about Shapeshift. Yeah. So Shapeshift, I mentioned how they were doing booming businesses this year and they've done more business this year than they did in 2016. And that's just March. Um, but anyway, so uh, popu- popular cryptocurrency exchange Ship- Shapeshift.io has raised ten point four million dollars in wow. Series A round in a Series A round led by Early Bird Venture Venture Capital with participation from VC firms such as Lake Star Found- Funders Club, Blockchain Capital, Pantera Capital, and Access Venture Partners. In previous rounds, Shapeshift raised two point four million dollars. So. Uh, that whether in a statement, Shapeshift explained that these funds are used to further expand the team to keep up with its rapid growth, uh, citing that their exchange now handles about fifty thousand bitcoins each month. So that's that's about <laughs> that's a lot fifty million each month, right? U.S. Wow. And uh, this statement goes on to say that Shapeshift will also release two groundbreaking exchange products later this year. So who knows what those are going to be? What a be, tease! But, yeah. yeah. What a tease! Honestly, I mean, the, the right now the biggest thing that you could release is is something like Project Alchemy, where you're linking two different blockchains together. You that know, would some be sort of huge. Yeah, that would be huge because then I mean, that's what Shapeshift does. Like the, it flips coins, right? Right. So in in the flipping, or as we prefer to call it, the diversify your coins, the grand diversification, the, the, the grand diversification. Oh yeah, you got to diversify your bonds. Yeah, that's right. That too. That's right. <laughs> Just like Ziaz said. Yeah. Yeah. Wu-Tang gotta, Financial. Yeah, you got to keep those funds in diverse. 
Okay. Well, and for people who aren't familiar with Shapeshift, it's a really it's it's a tool I definitely use. It's really easy. You can exchange uh, seamlessly in between different digital currencies, and you don't have to sign up for an account or anything. It's really slick and convenient. And it started, I think, in 2014 in Switzerland. And the interesting thing I took away from that article, I, I wasn't aware, but it it differs from an exchange in that it isn't independent. It isn't uh, sort of decentralized, hooking buyers up with sellers. You, when you are buying let's say ethereum from shapeship you are actually buying their ethereum and selling them your bitcoin or, da- or whatever right. you were exchanging so i did, i it's just a kind very of a true exchange i thought it was uh, just kind of syncing up buyers and sellers like other exchanges but uh yeah that was what i learned from that well, article and, and it makes sense that that would be an efficient model to follow it's just now you have to sort of link in the back end of well i i have to get rid of so many bitcoin to make sure i have so many ethereum or whatever it might be so. right and you can take care of that on exchanges yep uh the, the uh, i wonder what kind of ai they got running over there man. Uh, or it's, it's got it's got to be smart i mean you don't could, think it could just come up at least initially as some person like so yeah, or, like joe is man in the booth or it's like oh we just sold some doge and we need to buy some doge you know right. it could be just that simple doge yeah. Yeah. Well, well with, with we're not ten, giving advice to buy or sell things here. No, Darren. we're not. With ten point four million in, in investment, they they might be yeah, looking for at some, at some AI. You what know? are you, what are you at, gonna do with all that money? Anyway, uh, you know what? It, we'll find out with their two groundbreaking products. But moving on, uh uh Bitcoin Infinity, Darren. Yes, Bitcoin Infinity. So our friend right here in New Hampshire has released uh ba- Matt Whitlock has released a Bitcoin Infinity patch for the Bitcoin core client. Clients running uh, Bitcoin Infinity would follow the longest chain period. So uh, now uh, Matt intends for this to be used as a client uh, that core supporters could keep, could basically use to keep track of uh, another chain, meaning the unlimited chain. and or, or <laughs> Without whatever. running the software. Yeah, without running unlimited software. So uh, I, I think this is a, a good development, but I, I mean, it, it's uh, some, some people online was a little bit confused. This patch is not meant for mining. It's not meant to be the main client right. for Bitcoin. It's just a client you can use that will keep track of your longest chain Bitcoins. So um, okay. So if you if you are interested, and and actually it might be very useful if you were wanting to be on the core side, you could probably just have the blockchain on your computer once and not have to have two different blockchains. So, well, talking about the core side, uh, we we've got it. We, something we sort of passed over last week, we talked about the idea from Bitcoin Core dev team member to change the proof-of-work mining algorithm, which would cause all of the current ASICs mining to basically be useless for Bitcoin. Or they'd have to be used for the other... Well, so some other coin. Yeah. Or, right, or Bitcoin Unlimited. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, the uh, basically, uh, while, not lot long before that, earlier this month, in fact, there was another uh, suggestion put out there... That, something called a user-activated soft fork. And so just recently, the person who put that out there um, has his name Shaolin Shaolin something. Yeah. And anyway, uh, he 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 actually pushed out a a target date Mm -hmm. to activate this on. Yeah, I think it's a target block number, and I think it's between September and October. It'd be flag day, the same target day they used in the past for P2SH. Okay. So... Uh, basically, what this would do is it would force the activation of SegWit uh, at that target date. It would the activation process would begin, and then whatever conversion time, I don't know. What I think it would just start rejecting any block that's not SegWit. So, and then there was talk uh, from I, th- I don't know. I think it was um, the Bitmain, not Bitmain. Maybe it was the Ant Pool. Um, Jihan, Jihan Wu. I'm not. I'm mm-hmm. not certain. Um, but he was talking about a synthetic fork, creating a synthetic fork for the Bit, uh, Bitcoin Unlimited code base, which would basically what it would do is it would keep all the blocks in the chain, but it would uh, certain blocks would be basically orphaned, right? So blocks that that didn't fit whatever would be orphaned, but they they they'd sort of circumvent this by initially producing some zero transaction blocks that they would basically substitute for that. I, you know, I don't really know how exactly it would work, but Why the, is this a good a, idea? the synthetic fork idea would be an, uh, a response to the user activated soft fork. That's, is, it that's, a, is it an attack against the user activated? No, 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 no. I think what it would do is 
uh, much like you were talking about with Bitcoin Infinity, yeah, is it would it would just keep the chain oh, going? I see. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like it's a patch. Uh, that but I you don't could think it's I don't think it's exactly Bitcoin Infinity. The unlimited software because it produces the... uh, orphan blocks and it would it oh. look at blocks certain in different ways. So I, I'm not. I just read about it before we started the show, but. I mean, it's, it's so this is going back and forth, this sort of code wars, if you will, of, of well, this is how we're going to solve this problem. Mm-hmm. And then the, the the other side's like, well, this is how we're going to counter how you're solving it. And this is how we're going to counter your counter. And this is how we're going to. Well, uh, but like with what Matt did, it's just something you could use. Sure. That, you know, depending on what happens, it might really be useful for some people. And it's kind of like a middle of the road thing, although it it, it wouldn't be. A, a client that could, you know, fully support the Bitcoin infrastructure because it wouldn't really uh, support mining that well. Right. Well, it wouldn't. You're saying it's just a node client, well, right? It, it, assuming the unlimited uh, thing gets activated, then uh, then this, if you were mining with Bitcoin Infinity Patch, it would basically just mine on what the longest chain. And if the median emergent consensus is below that value... Uh, the, the below whatever the next if the next block is bigger than that median then you're you're most likely wasting hash power mining that so, I see so uh, uh, <laughs> interesting too uh, that Matt had posted his uh, Bitcoin Infinity patch on Reddit on both the R Bitcoin thread and the R BTC thread and it got censored and taken down on the R Bitcoin thread. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Well he did he and he did call it he said if you run this patch it will be an altcoin. <laughs> I guess so. And 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 yeah, according to him, sure. I mean he he does seem like a ma- a Bitcoin maximalist so um that probably but it seems is no like good. helpful information to put no, out there. I mean it's he's too- throwing it he's throwing a tool out there. And that might be useful. So yeah, I think uh, anyone can help use the tool, and and it could be helpful. Um, we'll for, of course have a link to it on neocashradio.com. The, yeah, we got that right there. Exactly. So for our last story, which you can of course find at neocashradio.com, where <laughs> neocashradio.com decentralized data storage platform storage manages uh, migrates to Ethereum from Bitcoin. Is that a surprise? So storage is an open source distributed cloud storage platform that up until recently operated on the Bitcoin based counterparty protocol, setting the rise in Bitcoin transaction fees and the Bitcoin network con- congestion storage is migrating to the Ethereum protocol. Now I want to just point this out. Storage is S T O R J. Got it. So I want to just, the way you spell it is very strange. Storage. Storage. Yeah. So S T O R J. Uh, it, it's in February alone. Storage stated that they had paid over sixteen hundred dollars in transaction fees, which was equivalent to thirteen percent of all payouts. The migration has begun and ought to take a couple months or less. So jo- this, this is something that pays people basically for ho- cloud hosting, like encrypted, yeah, exactly bit, bits, like shards of data or whole files or something like that. Yeah, uh, well, and they pay you for hosting and I, I don't think that i think it's one of the the same thing in, in like ipfs you don't know what you're holding got it right so that it could be a text document or an image or a video or who knows encrypted. Or, or a program right. but it's all encrypted and it's in pieces that's right. the thing um okay. so joining the migration is web browser brave uh the reasons for the move are the same confirmation times and transaction fees brave will be offering an initial coin offering for its ethereum based ad tokens in a white paper, the basic attention token is defined as the medium of exchange between advertisers and publishers. From the paper, quote, BAT is a payment system that rewards and protects the user while giving better co- conversion to advertisers and higher yield to publishers. We see BAT as an associated technology as a future part of web standards, solving the important problem of monetizing publisher content while protecting the user privacy. Yeah, I've, I've looked at Brave a little bit in the past. It's, it's, a, neat, it's a neat idea. I've used their browser a bit it basically allows you to uh to, to search the web privately and um the default behavior i think is to not allow ads uh it's, they do ad blocking and things like that their main concern is uh consumer privacy but also keeping malware and other things off of people's computers and uh helping prevent the things like s- selling of your data without your knowledge um, but you also have the option to turn on ads that they have uh, set up through their ad network, 
and it basically pays you have an option to get paid out in bitcoin for viewing these ads or you can uh send some of it back to the brave development team or donate to other charities or things like that but it puts the user in control of the ad experience um and so i I just read a little about this basic attention token um and, and it basically helps verify like when you have cost per cost per thousand clicks i'm sorry cost per thousand views or cost per click this would be something that sort of I think verifies again cryptographically like oh no this was a computer that viewed this ad at this time we can prove it but without revealing anything about your personal identity or shopping habits or anything like that like it's all completely anonymized so um yeah and, and you know what that's and the brave browser maybe that's the theme i mean besides the the grand the grand diversification the, the i mean without a blockchain you're not gonna have privacy i mean there, there is some encryption and some some other ways to have some privacy but I, it seems like the standard mainstream market ways of doing your internet, whatever, I mean, anything on the internet are, are just, they're not private. Mm -hmm. So, well, I mean, that's, yeah. And and when you research privacy or just uh, try to incorporate privacy and and encryption, meaning privacy, meaning encryption into your, uh, into your protocol of how you communicate, it actually gets kind of difficult. And, uh, it can t- cut down on you know the fluidity right. of of the product you're using. Well, uh, so excellent, great two uh, hundredth show, Darren. I mean, congratulations! Yeah. All right, uh, it's been a long haul, hasn't and it? And it's been great having you on, Randy. Thanks. So I'm and, a blast. And yeah, I'm learning so much. Excellent. Well, if I come off as at all like an expert, it's it's a mistake. I'm I'm just learning, but it's it's really exciting. Well, and we also, uh, if you've noticed, the blog posts uh, have been much more informative and well yeah. re- well versed, and that's thanks in part, uh, to, to, uh, to mostly Randy. in fact, to Randy. Yeah. Uh, so, um, always appreciative. The show keeps changing. We yep. will. The video is coming. Believe me, it, it is happening. It's just taking much <laughs> longer than we had anticipated, but uh, you will be able to watch us soon. And as always, we will be putting the shows up on YouTube so that you can at least watch my somewhat fancy animation on there. Although. You know, we have stopped listing Litecoin on the show, Darren, and it's it's in pretty much all our graphics and stuff. I don't. I, what's your thoughts? I mean, what's your feeling on Litecoin right uh, now? I don't think it's going anywhere. I mean, it has gone up price wise a little bit, but I, I I don't think there's anything that it's trying to do that others aren't doing and having difficulty doing. Right. So. All right. Well, there you have it. So. Uh, here with uh, Neo Cash Radio in the studio, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy for Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. As always, you can tune into our website at neocashradio.com, and you can retweet all the things. Please retweet all the things. And of course, you should you should really consider to div- diversify your your your, your, your bonds. Diversify your, bond. your bonds. That's right. Subscribe. And subscribe. Yeah. And listen every Wednesday night. Yeah. So, like my grandmother said the same thing. Diversify your bonds? Yes. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's right. That's how she said it. And don't buy war bonds. No. There we go. Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.